Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, powerhouse drummer for the cult, testament, and white zombie, Sean Tempesta. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities, Los Angeles and outside of Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. Jim, what is cracking? How are you today, man? Oh, you just, um, you know, bonerific. <laughs> bonerific? <laughs> well, I mean, what's going on with this? The, 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 just tell everyone, it's like a lot of people are consuming this with their ear holes, but if you are watching this on YouTube, what is this fist of power you have in the background there? Oh, the fist of power. Are you serious? Whoa. That is the iron gauntlet, okay? As brought to life in uh, Avengers Endgame. Okay, is it, you got to you got to kind of be up on this stuff. We that's should see. That's, out of the, that's, end of the, that's the iron fist. Devil's grip, the iron fist. That's right. <laughs> Motorhead, dude. All right. Look at wow, that. Look at that thing. Uh, Holy shit. Well, this is well. This is what I love well, about our our, our yeah. guest is because he's so. Our guest today is so outgoing. He's so approachable. He's so likable. I think he's a hundred percent Italian with that last name. But yeah, hailing, best. hailing yeah. from the Bronx, New York, fifteen years as the drummer with the Cult. But in addition, he's played with the best of metal, thrash, and rock. We're talking bands like White Zombie, Rob Zombie, Exodus, Testament, Helmet. The list goes on and on. Our friend. And John Tempesta, what's up, buddy? Hey, how you doing, guys? <laughs> to Thanks for joining us today, man. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you've always got a smile, man. We were just talking off camera um, about our favorite haunts in our neighborhoods here in Los Angeles. I'm over in West Hollywood. And if people want to find you, they can go to a certain bar. If people <laughs> want to find me in Nashville, they can go to a certain bar. They know it's, where you're at. It's been eight months that I've been to this bar, which is really great for my bank account, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the one we're but talking about, yeah. What have you been doing, what have you been doing in, in this thing, man, during this whole time, man? I'm trying to stay busy. I, you yeah. know, doing the uh, quarantine jams with a, a few people. And I, uh, I actually, I have another band called Motor Sister, which is really cool. It's a... It's like old school 70s rock with uh, Jim Wilson, Scott Ian, his wife Pearl, and uh, Joey Vera. Nice. And we just finished, I just finished my tracks, honestly, right before the lockdown happened at Dave nice. Grohl's studio, 606 in Northridge. So. Yeah. And a friend of mine uh, knew a girl that worked at the governor's office, and she gave me the heads up that they're going to do a lockdown. So I yeah. told everyone, everybody's freaking out like, Oh man, we gotta get out of here! And I remember leaving the studio. I just finished, and I went to the market and just stocked up for like freaking weeks, man. Oh, did you record in New York? No, no. This oh, was uh, when I did that. That was in March, so that was at Dave Grohl Studio in North. Mm -hmm. Duh. Okay, gotcha, the gotcha. Killer. So I'm really. We still have to finish the vocals and some overdubs, and then we're gonna do another record in December, a covers record. Well, you're you're. I mean, you're always working with somebody. I mean, I almost feel like. You know, you discovered the drums and then one handshake and recommendation and gig led to another. You've probably the most gainfully employed rock metal thrash drummer ever. How did it all start for you? I mean, you're from the Bronx, right? Is the zoo still yeah. there? Is that is that the thing? The zoo? The Bronx Zoo. Isn't there a zoo there? Oh, yeah. It's a great zoo, actually. And uh, my mom is still there. I was just a uh, matter of fact, I just got back last week. I was there for three weeks doing a record. Um well, my other friend I'll tell you about, but uh, yeah, same house, same phone number, same everything. So when I go home, I go home. The neighborhood, the neighborhood has changed dramatically, right. but it's still home, man. And I, you know, hanging out with my friends and getting together and just talking about old times. So, so it was a great place to grow up in the seventies, you know, with the music and everybody just in the neighborhood playing stick ball. Yeah. And, you know, just having their boom boxes out and listening to the best music and going to concerts and, Everything, yeah. I feel like you were that golden, perfect age to grow up in the 70s because you were a teenager in the 70s. I was born in July of 70s, so by the time 80, 81 hit, I was still only like 11 years old, and then I had to grow up in El Paso, Texas, which didn't have the same kind of opportunities that, you know, would come from being in the city. 
Yeah. I think that was like a golden age for you. So when you go see your mom, does she do the gravy for you and all the oh, stuff? Dude, I'm still full, man, from last week. I know. I went two weeks ago to see my mom, and she just loaded us up like three gorgeous meals a day. of a, You know, because she's Paradiso. So, you know, I could have actually gotten the name Richie Paradiso, Dick Paradise. Oh! <laughs> But I got the Welsh. Would have wound up a porn star. I got the Welsh last name Redmond. You know, Welsh is cool. Tom yeah. Chip. Dick Paradise. What's <laughs> dude? Yeah. The Adventures <laughs> of Dick Paradise. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, that, no, it was a great time, man. Um, like um, our my oldest brother Lenny, he's about he's like six years older than me, so I really got influenced by the older guys in the neighborhood, and like. Say I was born in '64, so '74. I was listening to Kiss Hotter Than Hell, or like right. you know Zeppelin and you know Aerosmith when they first came out, and all those great bands. Man, it was it was it was unbelievable back in the day. What and does my, your brother do? Uh, my, my my older brother, he works at the printing factory. So nice. I've been doing that since my uncle was like the foreman there. So he's you know, printing all the posters for your bands that you've been touring yeah. with all these years. I'm sorry. He's printing all the posters for the bands he's been yeah, touring. Yeah. <laughs> Get to work. Yeah. Wow, man. So what's when do you get the first drum set? When do you get the bug? What's the first gig? How does the whole thing start? It happened with my next door neighbor, Charlie Castelluccio. Good wow. friend. And he was uh, my brother's age. He was an <laughs> NYPD de detective. Oh, wow. And he had a kit, um, you know, a cheap blue sparkle kit, and he was selling it. So he asked my mom, like, hey, I'll, I'll sell this kit to Johnny for $25. So I begged my mother, like, please, please, please. So, she, you know, she fell and <laughs> she actually did it. She got me the kit. And it, and it was right, honestly, next door. I just lifted the drums over, the, you know, the porch and everything. <laughs> and then set them up in the basement. And then uh, I remember cleaning the kit and putting jewelry around the kit. I was so into it. And uh, that was it for me. Like, I... I, I when I was like, I think it was what, elementary school, around 11th grade, uh, no, sixth grade, what am I talking about? I remember looking at drums. I just loved the look of drums and just everything, and going to the, um, the dictionary and seeing, it was a shitty picture of a black and white kit, but then I would go to public library and they had downbeat magazines. So what I would do, I seen ads for like Pearl or like Tama drums, and I would cut out the actual ad, and I would send them, oh, please send me a catalog to the companies with the address. And they did. They all send me catalogs. So. That's awesome. Yeah, and I still have a lot of them. And um, and it just started from there, man. I was so into the drums. And Charlie, he knew that I was very into it. And, and my dad, saw that he got me lessons from, you know, the, the local music store, Scalable Music, where Charlie Bonanti went to as well. Yeah. And so um, then Charlie had tickets for David Bowie in 77 in Madison Square Garden. An extra ticket asked my mom another thing and I begged her for. And he took me on the train. We went on the train to Madison Square Garden. And the seats we had was right. They weren't the best seats, but it was great for me because it was looking across Dennis Davis, you know. Yeah. I thought that was Billy Cobham. He had the... Uh, um, the Tama uh, bass drums, but they had North Toms and everything. Oh, yeah. it's big, uh, big Swiss symbols. It's, the, it's the live the live stage record I've seen. Wow! And that, that blew my freaking mind. I seen uh, Madison Square Garden, so that was my dream to play here. You know what I mean? I have to play the Garden, which I never played. I played every freaking. You arena. still haven't played? The wow! Every other arena in the in the country except the Garden, man. Wow! We were play it with Pantera, but it was so expensive at the time with the Union, blah blah blah. We played Meadowlands and that's. Nassau Coliseum. Yeah. And so, uh, long story short, um, after that, he was a big influence on me. We became friends later on. Um, remember Manny's music of Marco Ciccoli? Yeah. Oh, we right? love Marco Grappa, man. I guess my boy. Yeah. So I met Marco when I was 17 years old. I was a messenger, yeah. you know, yeah. in New York City, and I will always get messages to toward uh, 48th Street. And so like a messenger, like a bike messenger? No, I was a walking messenger. Okay. I, okay. I, you know, after high school, I get on the train, had a few hours, and I would always go to 48th Street. Yeah. And one time, um, well, this is later after the fact, I think we were doing a Letterman show or something like that, and I would always stop in to say hi to Marco and Manny's, and we're walking around, check out the gear, and there's this dude walking around. Marco goes, hey, Johnny, do you know uh, Dennis? I'm like, Dennis Davis. I went, whoa! I go, you were the first drummer I ever fucking seen in my life. And they're like, dude, I know who you are. I want to see you play. And, and I'm like, I was bugging out. Like, you're the guy. And we were playing Roseland in New York two weeks later. And I went back to the same place in Manny's 
um, when, you know, before sound check or the day before the day off, I ran into him again. And he goes, um, dude, I'm going to come and see your show. And I looked at Marco. I go, you think he'll come? He goes, yeah, yeah. I was a man of his word. And I put him on the guest list. And it was a big show for me. It was the first show for New York on the, on the Rob Zombie Hillbilly Deluxe Tour. Yeah, oh, sold wow. out. Like Tommy Lee, Nikki Six is there, all my family and everyone. And so I'm all pumped up, getting ready to go. And, and before I went on stage, the guy, the security guy downstairs goes, um, uh, just want you know, Dennis Davis is here. I'm like, whoa, he, he showed up. You know? <laughs> I, had, I had the best show. So after the show, I got all ready, showered and everything, went to say hi to my friends friends and family and there's a stairway down you know down from roseland I open the door i see dennis is the first person i see and he goes like this to me bows to me and i just had goosebumps and that was it man you know I that's mean, amazing that was like a, a, a massive boost of confidence and absolutely yeah. to, to have your hero become your friend is a yeah, cool yeah. thing and then i moved back to new york and we would hang out this yeah night. you know he passed uh, few years ago actually a couple months after Bowie died so but uh, he's a legend what an incredible drummer he was and and Matt Cameron and I have the same kind of story he was living in San Diego and he's seen that tour back then we're, we're the same age and everything so yeah it's kind of funny like you know he's a big influence on us I, ju I just Rich, feel like Rich yeah just one thing <laughs> yeah Rich one gig after the play. next man mm -hmm. Rich what was it Jimbo me play you just watch me play and shake your head. Like, <laughs> I'm like, there's my guy. They don't. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have this. My hero, and he just looks at me like, just put the sticks down. <laughs> no, Jim had a Jim had a fun playing career. We're both from Connecticut. We're both Canadians. I'm from Milford, Connecticut. Milford. Okay. I'm, from, I'm from Danbury. I was just in Danbury. I spent the night at my friend's house just two weeks ago. Yeah. Where in Danbury? Oh, I have no idea. But he likes okay. lives in the woods. He calls it the tree house. <laughs> Yes, his old like, big, his drum kit set up and his guitar. We were jamming. It was a fun hang, man. We used to play at Tuxedo Junction and Toad's Place and all those Toad's, other spots. That was Toad's Place by I mean, Yale, right? Yeah, yeah. I played there with <clears throat> this, and I remember a Zombie playing there. Yeah, yeah, God, yeah. That was a. Fun I think I might have seen you guys play there back in the nineties. The um, you ever hear of uh, the Briar Patch up in Pauling, New York? I know that name. Right? <laughs> I know that name. I probably played it. That was like home for us. We played there Wasn't every, there a every club month. club that was up there? It was connected to a strip club or some shit? This one was connected to a bowling alley. Okay. <laughs> Not quite as exciting. Yeah, you know. Not as exciting. But There's the know. one in Iowa that had the bowling, bowling we, alley. My first, my first professional, well, I don't even say professional, but original playing gig was opening for Nuclear Assault. Yep. Remember those guys? Nice. Danny Loco. Loker, mm -hmm. Anthrax bass player, original Anthrax bass player, SOD. Man. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Charlie really kind of took you under his wing and he got you the tacking job. It's so interesting that that was one of your first professional forays into the biz because it's so funny. When I moved to Nashville, mm -hmm. I had all sorts of people saying, Rich, never tech, never let anyone see you pushing a case. And no. because then they'll be burned in their mind that that's what you are. Yeah. It worked out the opposite for you, where Absolutely. tons of people got to see you play. It's the it's the ne next best thing to playing, and I yeah. always, you know to anyone like if you're out there because you're out there on tour and people are seeing you play. And for instance, for me, I was sound checking, and, and it was um, extra to see me play. They were the first band opener for Anthrax, which came later, but then Testament came. They opened up as well. I'm like, hey man, you know. Well, Exodus asked me, like, the drummer couldn't do the tour. I'm like, I never played that kind of music back then. I was just right. like, you know, a hard rock, cozy Powell guy. And, you know, like UFO, Judas Priest is just heavier, like, except. And like, yeah. this is thrash. But I learned a lot from Charlie. And it started with Charlie. It was like, he just asked me, like, kind of as a goof, like, hey, why don't you come on tour with me, man? I'm looking for a tech. I'm like, really? At the time, I was in the band, but our singer left. And it was impossible to find a singer. I'm like, shit, this could be fun. It was the best thing ever. I'm out of my parents' house. I'm getting paid. I'm seeing the world. I'm having laughs with my friends. And, you know, it was the best. And it, it, it actually brought me into the two bands I, I was able to play in. Yeah. What tour was that? Or what tours? Uh, with Exodus, it was Headbangers Ball Tour. It was mm -hmm. at the end. And that's how I was learning the set. 
Perry Strickland from Violence came in after, and then I, I was listening, and I would just, every day off, and I just practice on the days off, and like, I never auditioned. The tour is booked. Check this out. So I get <laughs> home in LA, I'm like, my drums are shipped up to a San Francisco, Oakland area, and I go up there, I'm like, man, I hope I can nail this. The tour's already booked, so there's a like, you know. This is formality. And yeah. I nailed it. And then, and the first gig was at Lemoore's in Brooklyn. I was like, holy shit, a hometown show. And, and we didn't go on till 1.30 in the mornings. Oh, but oh. It, was, it was great. And, and that was my start. It was like, you know, being a professional drummer. And it went so well that um, they had signed a record deal with um, Capitol Records. Nice. And they, they brought me along and got me my, I got my first endorsement with Sonar back in the day. We were yeah. managed by Bill Graham Management, had some clout. I'm like, I want Sonar yet at the time. So. Yeah, I was with Sonar going. for about a decade, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. I still have my kit, man. I'll never sell that kit. Well, yeah, I love the drums, but that I was I was always shredding the hardware. Like, I would, like, really? the cymbal stands are just like. Sonar? Like, wow. I would. I would break um, that shit, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to say the DW Hardwell. You're a longtime Tama guy. What is it, like 20 years now or something? Uh, 26 years now. And wow, and you got a signature snare drum. Dude, and they, yeah. they love you. Man, uh, they're, they're a great company. I mean, yeah. honestly, they're a family company, just like DW, and just great people and designing my snare drum. And a lot of people are really digging it. Yeah. The one thing that blew me away was, um, you know, Vic from um, Chicago, Oh, yeah. oh, God, we love Vic. He tells me, this, this drummer from the band, Fish, you know, he, he's like, he's very particular. He's in his drum shop checking it, like, for hours, checking out snare drums. Yeah. And it's my snare drum. And he sends me a photo and sound check with my freaking snare drum with the band Fish. Like, yes. so, Jam band. I love it. <laughs> it's nice seeing all these. And Danny Carey plays my snare. He, he goes through like, a few snare drums, like, opens up the set or whatever, and... Dale from the Melvins and Matt from King Diamond and it's great, Matt, uh, you know Braun from Mastodon. So it's it's really nice seeing people play my snare. That sounds like an expensive drum. If all those guys like that, it's not a hundred fifty dollars snare drum. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not as much as a bell brass. So it's kind yeah, of yeah. Like, now I was going to ask you if you got a bell brass somewhere, a real deal, for like you know from I back did. in the day. That's what I use in the White Zombies. So yeah, wow, I have a early eighties one. Yeah, the real yeah. seven seven inch by fourteen inch. Brass snare drum. Yeah. It's got to be loud. It, it cuts, man, but it has yeah. a nice tone to it. It's two millimeter brass and it has a nice wood tone. It has an Alex Van Halen sound. So uh, <laughs> you get really crank it, have the helmet sound. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Really happy. Have, have, you ever, um, have you ever met um, Craig Cramp, the session drummer from the 80s? I have not, but I know who he is. So, so, so he, he kind of moved to the Phoenix area, but he was like, he was the treasurer of our musicians union for a long time. And his only go to snare drum, he had this bell brass that he coveted. And like, he says, this is the only drum I need. Some guys show up with 30 snare drums. You can get a million sounds out of this thing. Absolutely. I only bring a few of them to- from any session I do, it's that one, my snare and old black beauty and yeah. you know, maybe a couple of woods, but that drum is so versatile, man. Yeah. I'm downsizing, man. It's like, you know, when they were in our early part of our career, we're getting some cloud, we're getting some notoriety. Things are, you got a little money. People are throwing things at you and you're like, yeah, man, I got 45 snare drums now. And then you bring 30 of them in all these cases to your the old days, and the black beauty sits there the entire <laughs> session. And you're like, what am I doing? And the producer's like, put up that bell brass again. Yeah. <laughs> Is it so, one of those things that you want to switch out the snare drum, but it's a pain in the butt? I know. It's like, oh, that thing's freaking heavy, man. Here we yeah. go. With that. <laughs> yeah. you, gotta, you know, just got to make sure it's tuned and you got to yeah, well, hey, the snare drum height. Well, yeah. it's the, it depends also, I think, on the budget and the room and the, the laziness factor of the engineer. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, in Nashville, we're like, we cut five songs every three hours on demo sessions. So that's wow. 35 minutes per song. And when we do master recordings, like it's two songs every three hours. So you got 90 minutes per. So sometimes the engineer just wants to go like, look it, we're in a, we're in a world-class studio. There's 30 foot ceilings. The, the black beauty sounds great. Mm-hmm. Don't touch it. And let's just get the track, you know? Sure. Yeah. But I'm so jealous of a lot of your recordings because I went on a Spotify um, rabbit hole with all your discographies and you always get this insane larger than life sweat fueled 
rock drum sound, right? <laughs> and in country music, usually the vocal is like right here in your face. It's slapping you in the face. It's like, you got to hear the story. And the drums are a little bit further back. And then, of course, the Shania Twain records happened with Mutt and the drums kept getting further. Oh, but yeah. not as not as big in the mix as, as the stuff you've done. So, like, I'm, like, really jealous. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy. Um, and till this day, it's funny. I was I was texting with Rob Zombie the other day, and there was this photo that popped up us in the studio. And there's no photos of us like behind the soundboard. And like, where did you find that? And so, and that was with Terry Date, who did all the Pantera records, and and Ulrich, and and I was able to um, get Je you know who uh, Jeff Chonis is? Yeah. Like, God tech, Ringo Starr's tech, and he owned Drum Paradise at the time. Right. And and I was tight with Joe Hibbs at Tom, and he was good friends, and he brought me a prototype of a Star Classic kit with Grand Star Lugs, and he brought the Bell Brass snare drum in for that one. And I also used Simon Phillips' bass drums, his white art, art star bass drums for that session. So yeah. I was like, oh, man, like this, and it, the drums are just so punchy and like powerful, man. And that's the reason I was with Bell Brass. Yeah. yeah, Pantera just defined a sound. I mean, it oh, took he, the... Yeah. Uh, and Vin, that, Vinny had a great ear, man. He knew exactly what he wanted. Yeah, real tight, real crack, yeah. a lot of attack. Crack. And, and, and yeah, and Pan and uh, Vinny's dad was a, is like a is like a music producer in Nashville. I've never got to meet him. I believe he's still alive. I think he I is. I think he is. You know, here's another kind of funny story. I've been dating a girl for two years. Her name is Kara. She's a fashion designer. But we were both in Dallas, Texas at the same time in the 90s. And she used to pal around with Vinny all the time. And she said he loved me because I had a job. I wasn't a stripper. Um. <laughs> yeah, he, he was honest and wise. I said right. that's hilarious. That's great. Well, that's what an amazing guy, amazing yeah. guy. Always had the best time hanging out with him. Yeah. Anytime yeah. I went to Dallas, I, you know, I, I spend the night at his house and whatnot and go out and, yeah, man. With the Crown Royal pool. I wanted to see it, but oh, it, cool. it didn't make it over there, Probably man. One day and, you know, get a day off, we go there and have barbecues. That boy knew how to cook, man. Great yeah, yeah. I'm inspired to do some grilling here late in life. I just turned 50, so I went out to the uh, Joshua Tree and ran around naked like Matthew McConaughey and played drums and looked Did at I? the stars. And uh, they and and there was a nice naked? no. Well, I mean, you know, that was there. With, it was just me and Kara, and I had the grill there, the grill master, and I was throwing on dogs and brats and burgers. It was I was like. I have made fire. It was like so great. Why did I wait so long? Because I feel like sometimes it's like guys like us, we're like traveling. We're and we and we're we've got four meals a day and catering. We're living in airports. We're not cooking a lot. No, man. It's you know, such a release, isn't it? It really is. And then if you can finally get a girl that knows how to cook, it's a good thing. You got to hold on to her. You're set, dude. You're set. <laughs> It's funny, I was just talking about Matthew McConaughey uh, to my friend yesterday. They go, do you know he came and jammed with us on stage? playing Tungas. It was uh, South by Southwest years ago, and he's friends with the cult guys, and he wanted to come up and jam. So it was his song, Spirit Walker, and like, just play along. I showed up with the drums, and it was freaking hilarious, man. Such That's a awesome. great guy, too. Wow. All right, all right, all right. I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, the first thing I asked him, like, all right, all right, it's the first thing I said, like, yeah, man, it just came up. It's from a David Bowie song, man. That's what I got. It just came off the top of my head, man. It was great. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> Every, man. I so, but you know, also my impression of you is that you're so likable, and you always do such a pro job, and people like being around you. I feel like every band you were ever in, you could have stayed in for the rest of your life. So, how do you go about knowing when it's time to leave, and how do you break the news to your but guys? It's been great. I know you gave me this opportunity, but I'm gonna go over here. Like, did it ever get ugly, or were people like, no, no we get it? Totally. Every, everything was kind of cool. I, you know, being at the right place at the right time, it's always been that for me in my, in my life. And yeah. with Exodus, I mean, we, you know, I was with them for a few years. And I remember the last tour, it, this, <laughs> this is the one, like, when you're playing the Palace Theater in Hollywood, right? And your record label's Capitol Records, and the record label's across the street, and nobody shows up to your show, you know something's wrong. So I was like, oh, boy. So, you know, that's when the band got dropped and in Testament, they were moving on doing something else. And they had asked me, and I just want to keep busy playing instead of sitting around waiting. Yeah. And then I did I did a great record with Testament, the low record I'm very proud of. And my name came up like White Zombie was auditioning drummers. And it was, for me, um, 
it, it, it was it was easier for me because I was living in L.A. at the time and White Zombie just moved there. And so that I would commute back and forth to the Bay Area. So nice. and when I got the call and then I talked to the tour manager, Ted Kedick. He goes, hey, man, I was literally like three minutes away from my apartment to the studio, Bill's place. And like so I met with him that day and uh, he gave me a lot of advice. They were using like drum spikes. Remember those LP spikes, you know, trigger. oh, my God. Yeah, I did that before. So I was like, yeah, you want to use these? And I went there. I just went, wow. Like I just got for testament. Like you might not want to do all that stuff. But but I knew they, they needed a groove drummer. You know, that, that that's my style is just groove, every groove. And like if yeah. I could put that into that band, I think it'd be pretty powerful. And when I, I was just very confident because I just felt like I had nothing to lose. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if I don't get the gigs, so what? You know, I'm still, in, you know, with Testament and very happy with the band, friends of mine. And, and, and you know, the first song we hit was Black Sunshine. And Sean, the bass player and I, it's bass and drums, and we just locked, man. Yeah. And that was it. And Rob was sitting there, like, watching. Like, oh, I mean, you got to have the... Yeah. I mean, every note, you could just feel it oozing out of your body. I mean, there's, like, certain yeah. drummers that have that thing. And, and when it comes to, like you know commitment you know you got that you know you got that down and you just built upon it the rich redmond show will be right back henry ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it nothing could be truer about energy efficient led lighting in your business at big dot lighting we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial led lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all until then you're paying for them anyway book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with big dot lighting at least 30 percent of your utility bill is waiting to be saved go to big dot lighting.com this is the rich redman show what's interesting to me is thrash music i've never played thrash music how do you bring groove like when i'm playing when i'm playing a groove oriented thing we're all thinking about the relationship of the quarter note and the subdivision and putting that snare drum in the same place there might be some postural things or some body language things to create that thing and keep it for three and a half minutes but when you're playing like like how do you make that groove what's the how do you think about it i mean like I, I didn't play super crazy fast. I think with, with Exodus and stuff, I mean, there was some fast stuff, but it wasn't Slayer Anthrax craziness. There was moments, but I just always felt like the groove. It just needed to, you know, to just translate with the guitar play, especially in thrash music, like with the heavy guitars of Gary or Rick you know, and, yeah. and, you know, and those guys are so heavy or Eric Peterson. You want to pronounce that, that kick and snare right in your face, man, you know? And, yeah. um, and that's just just you know, even Metallica. You listen to old Metallica. It's it's the drums and and, the, and James Hetfield. And I mean, it's just like it punches you right in the face. And a lot of groove, man. You know. And I feel like it, it needed it needed that. And that's just my style. So maybe I just did something differently or whatnot. And I just played a lot of heavy, and it you know it was different. But. So did you just play along to records? Maybe, Jim, I don't know if that's your question. You're like, because because back in the day, I mean, would you buy like a Yamaha drum machine? And you just play to a cowbell forever. But something tells me you were a guy that put on Kiss records and just played for hours. I did. And you know what? Every gig I got, you ready for this one? I airplayed to every gig. I never actually played on the drum kit. I would listen to the, the songs and airplay it. That was my thing. From Exodus to Testament to White Zombie to uh you know brought a helmet and, and and even a cult i just airplayed it and because that was my thing as a kid i would like you know get into it get in the vibe you know, have the lava lamp when i was young and put the records on and blast my fucking headphones and get the vibe going i would just imagine playing what kit was like you know for, for the song or for the band you know so are you yeah, that's great that's a powerful tool like using your imagination to visualize yeah. i am going to recreate this and then you're getting the structure of the song the form of the song do you have a pretty yeah. good uh, pretty good memory because i literally i'm i scribble out charts for freaking everything dude. i do i mean if there's stuff i need to like scribble down i'll do i i just could be like are you writing charts for this i just what well, i kind of just implanted in my head i listened to it so many times i just like going for takes and whatnot yeah so. But uh, yeah, there, there's, you know, cheat charts and all that. Yeah, yeah. You know. Did you, when you I were coming I, up, like, did you learn to read the, traditional music or did, was it just to, like drum notation? Yeah, no, just, you'll just put like eight things. bars. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just like a bar, you like a verse, chorus, and chorus, you know, double yeah. chorus, and blah, blah, blah. So yeah. it's pretty like, 
Thanks for you. It's pretty easy to hide that on a bass drum rim or a high tom rim. Just I just duct tape it. <laughs> well, Bob Rock was in the last record. Are you taking notes? I'm like, yeah, I'm taking notes. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what were you going to say, man? I cut you off like 17 times, so thank you. Sorry. That's okay. I was going to say that, uh, you know, when you got exposed to Rob Zombie and his music, there was a lot more groove-oriented music in that. I mean, uh, he really kind of defined a genre of music that brought upon uh, the active radio revolution uh, or active rock radio revolution in uh, the late 90s. I mean, he was a big part of that. Mm -hmm, definitely. You know, I mean, did you, did you, did you kind of pick up on that once you heard the music? And well, that was more new? of my style was the groove. Like, like I said, right. before Exodus and Testament, uh, that was my style. I was like, I, I could destroy this. I mean, honestly, I, I, right. if I get in there, man, I'll just give them that, that, that groove, that punch, that cozy, or what, you know, whatever, that pocket, yeah. man. And I, I really thought it would, you know, bring him to but I mean, it's a, a as soon as you heard how you know white I mean, white zombie came out i mean i was in high school when i started listening to them it was uh 92 93 around that time and uh and then he kind of progressed from there uh mm -hmm. howard did a song with him uh great american nightmare did you play on that one too i was a, i was supposed to play on that it was with tommy yeah. victor from prong on guitar but it didn't work out for some reason i forget why but yeah right but i mean it was that whole genre of music you had your limp biscuits your um, seven dusts. I mean, those guys were just heavy and groove heavy. Well, that this came later for me after Zombie, after Rob. Then I joined Helmet, and that was a whole different thing. Like, because Paige Hamilton, like he was just here the other night, one of my best friends, and he really brought me to that next level of like, because they do odd time stuff, and like, yeah, I'm not saying he's a monster drummer, but he just locks it and Paige. He always had so much patience, you know, when I'm playing, like, I can't get this part. I was like, we'll just keep playing it. We'll just keep looping it, you know? Ah, and, yeah. and you loved it. You went, and, and the more you did it, the more you just locked in. I was like, and you just going like this, man. I mean, yes, uh, he, he was the guy. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't be those bands, man. He so, was the king. Well, what, what, what happened with John at the moment? Was he just taking a break that you came in, or was it just they wanted to? No, they broke up. And uh, what ah, happened was uh, right. someone had broken up. And he had a band called Gandhi. He was living in New York. And then he moved to LA and a friend of mine, Renee Mata, said he was friends with Paige and like, hey, he's looking for a band to put together. And and so he put me in contact. And um, what happened was we went to, um, what was that? The, remember the Cat and Fiddle? Oh yeah, it moved over now to like uh, South Highland. Yeah, yeah, by Sunset. Yeah, Sunset. Yeah, High. yeah right there. And yeah. we met there one night. He brought a CD and, and we just hit it off. We just started having a couple beers and like, you know, and I'm like, you know what? Forget about listeners. I have a drum room. Bring your amp over and let's see how it goes. And and that was it. He plugged in. We, we just freaking gelled, man. And yeah. we've been friends ever since. And as a matter of fact, I live in this house now because he used to live right next door to me. So that was a big reason I moved here. <laughs> so do you, do you set up and thrash at the house or do you go somewhere? Do you like to go keep your house, your house, room. and then your office, your office? Yeah, I actually, I have my other bedroom. I have a Roland like TD 50 kit, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. mess around. If I do stuff, people send me, it's just but not I, the I same have my room, big kit in the drum room. I could yeah. barely get in there. It's like at mates, you know, I have a little drum room down there yeah. and the, so that's where the big kick comes in. So if I really want to get nuts. That's why you should move to Nashville. I mean, you that's what they well, Ray Le when no. I was there, Ray Lazier goes, I was, I was there for a couple of days and um, it's like, you got to come over to my house and see what I have compared to what you get in LA. I'm like, oh, yeah. it was like, a, it's like a mansion. It's insane. Yeah. All the drummers, all my drummer friends live out there, man. They get a basement. I mean, you spend all your, your youth trying to get out of your parents' basement. And then, you know, you want to get back Because I grew up in basements in New York, you know, yeah. being back east and stuff. And yeah, I like that. We'll yeah, see. but the sun is shining so beautifully right now. And it is, what's the weather like there? I, yeah. It's Right now, it's 77 degrees. Sunny. That's what you trade. Right that's now what here? you. Yeah, in Nashville, what is it? Rainy and 50? Uh, it is. Well, it's kind of overcast and 50 degrees. I like that too, though, man. I always, that, was, that was always my favorite weather when it was raining or snowing, like gave me an excuse yeah. to stay home and play drum and not going out and, you know. My but the leaves are friends. changing. You know, people people are drinking pumpkin spice. And, I love uh, all that. That's my favorite time of year in Nashville. And then between December and March, it turns into London. Rainy, foggy London. That's it, right? Yeah. 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 
Well, it's funny when the pandemic hit last year, it was like, uh, I think we had like three weeks straight of rain where people had that Chris Farley meme. We're like, for the love of God, stop raining. <laughs> <laughs> Down by the enough, river. Man. I know. I'm, thinking for like, I'm good for a few days of rain, but after, even with snow too, I'm like, all right, I had enough, man. Let's go. Yeah. Well, up in the Northeast, I mean, once you once you realize that you were living, you know, how many times would you have a Northeast or Nor'easter roaring up the coast in freaking April, and all of a sudden you get, you know, two feet of snow dumped on you on April 28th? Yeah. I oh, I hated that about that, that's That was the thing for me when I first came to L.A., my friend Dante and I, we came out here as a fluke, just like, you know what? There was an airline. It was People's Express Airline. Do you remember that? 99 that bucks, airport? right? $99. Yeah. So my friend and Dante, his parents dropped us off. This is, this is a funny story. <laughs> and, uh, we go to, we get there and he brings all these bottles of Bacardi, or small little bottle, bottles. And we're kids. We just get wasted in the airplane. We, we get off the airplane like, okay, where do we go? This is before Uber. So we found this woman cab driver and she was older woman. I'm like, Hey, we want to go by the rainbow. Where do we go? And this is our budgets. Like my son's in the band. And she took us to, at the time was called the park sunset, which is now the Grafton hotel. Right. And it was like 75 bucks a night. And it was a Monday night and we got settled on this. Is great. It was a rainy night actually in January. And we walked from there. We couldn't get a rental car until the morning. So we walked from the hotel to the rainbow and we're sitting there having a burger. And we look across it. It's Lars and James from Metallica over there. Just sitting the at the bar. Not this from Alexa records. They were mixing master puppets there. And I said, hello, cause you know, anthrax and, and that was it. It was January's beautiful. And like in the music scene, like, I'm moving here and I had it was free. I get back to New York. It's freezing cold. I'm like, nah, man, I'm done. You know, that was yeah. it. That was yeah. it. Yeah. You know, you know what's funny about like metal drummers and heavy drummers is that off stage they're the nicest people. Like typically, <laughs> you ever notice that? And I think the reason why is because they get all their aggressions out on stage. Absolutely. Is like, hey, they just can't be angry. Oh uh, yeah. Most of my fr- I would have to say like ninety percent of my friends are drummers. So yeah. like. Oh, I love it. I, I we, met Charlie we, once. We have that fraternity. It's incredible. It really is. Yeah. Great, man. I met I Charlie. It. I met Charlie once on the uh, porch of Tuxedo Junction. He said hello, and and you know he was a huge influence on my playing for years. Jim wants and, him on the show, bad man. Okay, uh, we'll get him. Now. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'll mention it. Love to him. have him. Come on, Charlie. Right. <laughs> he, uh, yeah. He 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 he's a sweetheart of a guy. Just a, yeah. just a nice down to earth guy. One of my oldest friends, man. It's just it's so yeah. funny. Like um, we just talk about the old times and like, is it when Eddie died, you know, passed away and yeah. we were talking about, he mentioned it in his Instagram post. Like I was just texting with Johnny, like saying when, when Van Halen, it was the uh, diver down toward this garden. We had shitty seats up in the, you know, in the boonies and we made our way all the way down to like fifth row, man. Like, we, you know, we're from the Bronx. We don't give a shit. We'll work our way in there. And we did and. It was the most amazing show. Like we're just laughing at each other. Can you believe this? Man? Yeah, it's cool. Hey, is your pizza cool. joints what like in in New York when you go back? Do you, is it the same pizza joint you go yeah, like? Louis what, Nernie's what's baby, the original like race? Yeah, like that man. Okay, no, Louis okay. Nernie's in the Bronx, you know, and then and the Arthur Avenue. Oh, zero Arthur Avenue, Avenue bread. Oven, you know, it's a brick oven, and you know, you go to Brooklyn. This us, oh, you can't beat it. Now what out? Be, what about out here? There's no. We've there's come no, a long way. There's a Grimaldi's in El Segundo, which I haven't been to. Um, there's a, a Mulberry Street Pizza. My brother lives in Encino, and we get okay. pizza from there, which is good. There's a Joe's, a fake Joe's here, because I went to the real Joe's in New York. The owner was there. Because no, that's not my pizza. Pops <laughs> and shit. Yeah, so. <laughs> you get <getting> sued. <laughs> Every time we moved, it was always okay. Where do we got? Where do we find the real New York pizza? And we moved to Vegas in 01 for radio. Uh, it took us three years to find it. We could yeah, not find it. There. And then funny moving here, we found it within a couple of months with Joey's House of Pizza. You know, Where Joey's that? Rich. I still uh, have not been to Joey's. It's oh, downtown, God, right? You would love this place. I mean, it is, two people, I want to say they're from either Staten Island or Brooklyn. I want to say probably Brooklyn. But okay. uh, it's, it was a husband and wife. They moved down here, must have been in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, he could only make the pizza. They shut down on the weekends because he just didn't want to work on the weekends. He wouldn't let anybody else make the pizza. And to go there is like watching a show. 
because yeah. they're just screaming at each other. It's hilarious. I love it. And it's funny because the mother's sitting there, you know, she's like, hi, what would you like? I don't care what you're doing over there. You stay over there and do your thing. Hi, what would you like? I want to get you some pasta. You want some pasta? You want two pieces of slices? All right. Get him some two slices of pasta. You know, it's hilarious. Sounds like my mom's house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. It's a show. I know what he said, Ma. Ma. Was your mom always happy with your career decision here? She must be proud of you. Yeah, she is. It took me a while, man. Like, um, it's a funny story. I would talk on my drum clicks. My dad was, you know, from Italy. I'm first generation. My wow. Dad wanted me to go to college and do it. I was like, that ain't going to happen. I'm just like street guy, you know, high school. And luckily, I got through high school and playing in bands. And I was in different bands. He goes, Exodus, a testament. This is my dad, Enzo. With the Italian actor. Oh, what's the next band? The Ten Commandments? <laughs> so, it's pretty funny. So, oh, my God. I'm going to see the white zombie play and then give him a gold record. That was the biggest achievement. Then from gold to a platinum, double platinum, a trip, you know, so then he works, you know, my dad was an airline mechanic for Pan Am in the beginning. Then he wow. worked for United. So the younger guys in JFK is like, and the, you know, they're familiar with white zombie. Oh, that's my boy. So that was, that was, that was really heartfelt. For me. Oh my God. So can you speak a little Italian or no? I only the curse words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, most of my family's in Italy still. Like, really, I think that uh, I think that my people are from Napoli. Napoli, a lot of seafood, you know. And I went over and did a bunch of USO tours over there. And of course, you got to go to Pisa and get the picture of you holding up the the leaning tower. You got it, and it had the grappa. I had the real uh, grappa, Marco. and yeah, yeah. He would destroy us. We'd go there like early in the morning, and there'd be like Dennis Chambers and Will Calhoun, and you know, Marco. He brings out the Dixie cups, and like, ah, you know, yeah, yeah. Those are some good times, man. He's got the little vials of the grappa at the Nam show, and That's he passes good. you the little vial. Come on, you chooch. Let's go. <laughs> He's such a lovable character. So That's what's it What's it like being with the cult? That's your longest stay, right? 15 years? Is. That's yeah. a great run, man. I love it. You know, the, I just, I've always been a cult fan, and Charlie and I, we went to see the electric tour at the Fell Forum in New York, you know, when, when that, that tour happened in the... I used to wear a love shirt, like, you know, I'm, I was just so cr bizarre how it happened. I yeah. Mean, I, I actually went for an audition 13 years prior before I got the gig. My friend Ron Lafitte was managing them. He goes, listen, they're looking for a drummer. I was in Testament at the time. And he's like, I think you'd be perfect for the luck. And, you know, you have the sound and this and that. So I was really confident. And then again, I just felt like I had nothing to lose. I was sitting in my friend's apartment. I was pretty broke. And he drove me to Third Encore in L.A. There was no cell phones. And I'm there. I'm, I'm going to get this gig right now. It was, it was a freaking hot day too, man. And like he drops me off. I go to the reception, like, Hey, I'm here for the cult. Like, Oh, they're not here. They're not here today. Like, what are you talking about? They're not here. Like, no, they're not auditioning. And I'm like, they were burnt down on trying everybody out. I oh call my, my I have to go to a pay phone to call my friend. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. You send me, I was like, I don't know what's going on, but you know what? If that didn't happen, I wouldn't have got the white zombie gig. So it's all about timing. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I mean, you, the, the, the amount of passion in your playing, I watched this video from 1997 Modern Drummer Festival, and your tech is, I don't know who your tech is, but he's like two feet from you. He's got his eyes on you the entire time, and man, it just seems like you were a demon possessed, dude. It's so snappy, so articulate, a lot of energy. I was freaking parent. You know, I was sketch. That was my first clinic ever. It was Joe Hibbs and Tom. Was like, you have the to first clinic ever is Modern Drummer Festival? It's like a thousand people, and I have to talk to the crowd like, oh, you freaking kill me. So I asked Charlie, he was my surprise guest and that was charlie's drum tech at the time so. yeah and then you know when you like you get into so into it and you start tightening up like ooh, and everything's like tightening up but but you know what once i got up behind the kit and i went in, in front of the drum set and started talking to the crowd and you know they were very warming and giving and like they were laughing i was making them laugh and that kind of eased everything out so then yeah. Charlie came, I was, it was a big thrill for me especially man Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. You know John reminds me of, Rich? What's that? Sandy Gennaro. Oh, oh you know, Sandy's a I studied home. with Sandy. At, uh, at, uh, at his crib or over at the Drummer's Collective? Drummer's Collective. I was a team. Well, I was a messenger at the time, and 
Yeah, it was with him, and it was supposed to be Tommy Price at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of those, uh, those master classes, but Tommy couldn't do it for some reasons. But, and I'll never forget with Sandy, and you know, I'm like, dude, I had this double bass thing I did. I would do like eight notes on my left and leave with my right, and I showed him, I was like, that's really cool, and how do you do that? And it was, it was a big thrill for me, because I loved Sandy from Pat Travers and stuff, you know, back in the day, had all oh. the records. And I remember one time, we're in class. There was about like 10 students in there. All of a sudden he walks, two of these guys walk in. It's freaking Stan Lynch and Steve Jordan. And like, they're just goofing around, like just getting on the kit and like, whoa, man. That's how cool it was back in New York back in the day. I know. I just, so, and, and the school is still around, you know, it's just, of course, you know, having its typical transition times during yeah. this, you know, everything's kind of going online. I think but, Anthony uh, is not do, doing that anymore. Anthony's doing a uh, meat hook. Yeah, that's yeah, his, yeah. yeah. His, yeah. We're both we're both on there. We're both teaching on there. I believe. At the time I did with Marco and him, at, yeah, oh, man, we had some laughs, man. I love those guys. Yeah, yeah, man. I love Sandy. Sandy's been in uh, Nashville a good six years now, I believe. He's there too. Yeah. Who isn't there? Man? He stayed at my guest house, and I said, I'm "You should with move you, there." Jim. Hey, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go live with you for a while. How about that? <laughs> go right ahead, man. We got the <laughs> his wife's a great cook, so yeah. Tell you All what. Right? Yeah, I'll man. I'll make a trip down there. I know a lot of people. We'll, we'll do a hang one of these days. For Come sure. on Absolutely. down, man. Yeah, when it gets safe yeah, to travel again. out of here, we'll, we'll tell some, hey, Luzier, David Lee Roth stories and all that funny oh, stuff. Oh, my goodness, yeah. He was... Uh, he does, a good David Roth story. he does a good impersonation for sure. Oh, and then I... Hey, Luzier. Love him. Uh, yeah. That's monster drum. It's the sweetest guy, man. I remember yeah. jamming, like, when I first went there, he was at metal school and they played the Viper Room back yeah. then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Before we Steel Panther and Ray was a drummer. I'm like, who is this freaking monster? Yeah. And then he just hit it off, man. And I would go up and jam with those guys once in a while. So I cool. love that Ray's got like bissonette. He's got these little melodies and you could tell right away that it's him, you know. Um, you know, like uh, Ray's like guts, 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 or scabs this. Right. Yeah. And you could tell right away it's it's Ray, you know, and and the great bissonette. He was a big part of helping me out with the Modern Drummer Festival because I didn't know what to really do. And like, and, and, and I connected with him. He invited him to his house at the time. He was living in uh, Woodland Hills, right? Or, yeah, Woodland Hills. And he had the, you know, the, the David Lee Roth kit, the black with the white hardware, and had two kits and were jamming. And he picked up like, dude, you should play that. And he wrote stuff out for me like to talk about. So he was a big part of me like getting through that clinic. Man. That's awesome to hear, oh, man. He's another guy. Oh, man. Such a nice Amazing. guy. You as well, man. He's such a great guy. Oh, man. I'm, I, man, I appreciate it. I'll take it, man. And we, we've got, we've got this, this time in the trenches, man. But I feel like, I feel like you've got such a story. Like you really, whether you know it or not, you're like an, an extreme manifester. Like everything that you've wanted in your life has come to you. And it's like, you were like a fan of a band. You get the gig with the band. I'm like some guys are like that. Out. I think there's something in the, you know, what, what, what's going on in the universe. Something. You were just meant to do this, man. As really? a kid, that's all I know. <laughs> what am I going to do now? So do you, do you do some teaching? Do you like, cause someone's like, Johnny, I, I want to study with you. Can you show me like, what do you do? You... I don't. And like, I, I do get asked that a lot. I'm like, but I just don't. Yeah. I don't, I mean, what do I, it's like, I might sit, if, if one, one on one, like Skype, I can never do that. If you're sitting in a room, they can show you stuff. But yeah. I, don't know, I just don't have patience. Like I got that ADD thing going on, man. So. And did you ever? Happy. Did you ever try marriage or, or kids or just no? So I'm busy. Not engaged, but you know, nah, you know. I'm you got engaged. Happy. Yeah, a long time ago. So. Yeah. And then called it off. Yeah, cold feet, man. But I'm oh. I'm cool, you know. I'm you like your, you like your freedom, man. You like your freedom. Yeah, but maybe one day. You never know. Hey, man. It's all about timing, isn't it? It, it is all about timing. Have you read the new Percaro book? It's I about have, time uh, with Robin no. Flynn. Yeah, it's great. It's like Hudson is crazy. They're putting it. They put out the Liberty book. They put out the uh, Kenny, I think they went through another publisher, maybe Hal Leonard. And then mm -hmm. they've got this uh, Jeff Percaro book. I mean, unbelievable. The, the, the level of what he brought to the music world for like a decade and a half. And he died at 38 years old. Yeah. So prematurely. Did you ever cross paths with him, Jeff? I did not, but um, I'm friends with Steve Luke at there, and we had a lot of talks about him. Like, yeah, you know, I was friends. I'm like, I would just like chew his ear. Like, so what was he like? And like, what a groove that guy had, man. Wow. Pocket. Pocket. Right? Like a God given angelic <laughs> like, thing, man. Dude, he was the guy back then, too. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Rosanna yeah. is still a challenge. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
there's a handwritten transcription of the groove in the back of the book mm-hmm. of in Jeff's handwriting. He wrote out the, the groove for Rosanna. Is that right? Yeah. I have to get it. It's a good little read, man. It's definitely for sure. I love those books. Definitely. It's fool in the rain a double time. Right. And I, well, I think he, you know, he really got it from Bernard Purdy. That's right. The you know, yeah. What's that? The sweet. What was the Benoni Shuffle? Right. It's like a Babylon Sisters from the Steely Dan record. Babylon. Halftime shuffle. Yeah. Ah, oh, so good, man. Me. So hey, we've got this part of the show that Jim loves. I love. I always end up loving it. We might even give you two questions today. But it's the it's random corona. question of the day. Uh oh. Random question. It's the random question. Random question. Random question of, of the, the day. day. All right, I've actually got a random question here. (laughs) I'm reading it, and I think this is a good one. I'm going to go with it. If you were hired to show tourists what life is really like where you live, what would you show them slash have them do? Wow. Like, where I'm at right now, I'd probably take them up to my house and, like, bring them to the drum room. I'd do a little show and tell with the snare drums. That's what I usually do. I have people come over, check out my snare drum collection. You want to see it? I got a pretty good collection. Yeah, man. Yeah. Someone, I met someone at the exit in one time, and they're like, hey, my friend Johnny tempesta has got, like, 60 snare drums, man. How oh, many? Yeah, so I got rid of a bunch. But he goes, how many do you have, man? <laughs> Can you see them all? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's incredible, man. Yeah, this is the cool room. You know, I got the plaques up here. I got my old Tama 80s kit. And- Dude, I love it. I hope you have Simply Safe at home uh, protection yeah. plan. <laughs> yeah, here's, the, uh, here's the rolling kit, right, Jim? Yeah, oh, that's the big daddy. But yeah, it's always a good hang, sit there and just talk about music and look at the plaques and whatnot and, and you know, and just talk about the records I did and whatnot. So, it's kind I of fun. love you it, a man. Jaws fan. Yeah. All right, there's that. <laughs> All right, there's that. Jaws. Yeah, I saw the poster on the back of the wall. Oh, the Jaws poster. poster, baby. You know, Chief. Get a love I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a horror guy. Did you ever get into horror films like with Rump, you know, the zombie thing? You know, cause he's- oh, yeah. that's a, I mean, like, uh, with The Exorcist, man, that was one of the first ones I seen as a kid. And, you know, I, I just recently watched it. Scares the shit. I mean, it still like, holds up. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. That's a freaking scary movie, isn't it? And which one was the I last one you mentioned? Baby. Rosemary's, Rosemary's baby. baby. God, yeah. You ever Even seen Race with the Devil? Race Rose with the Devil? Devil? Yeah, it's Peter Fonda. Those guys go in a motor home and stuff with like, they have, like it's, a, it's a two couple thing and, and they go out and, and like maybe in the Ozarks somewhere and it's a like Ku Klux Klang thing and like, oh, it's pretty creepy. You should check that out, man. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, you'll dig My it. My son, because it's Halloween, he's been on a big horror movie kick and has been yeah. wanting to watch the family to watch. Uh, uh, horror movies. We watched the new version of Child's Play the other night. <laughs> it was actually pretty good. I really yeah. enjoyed it. It was gory, though. Man. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know who's Chucky is uh, Mark Hamill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Luke Skywalker. Yeah. He does the voice of Chucky. He's a voiceover really? guy. He's a oh, serious God. voiceover guy. He's got like 100 voices, I think. I didn't know that. Isn't that crazy? Oh. That's why you haven't really seen him. He did Star Wars. He did Corvette Summer and then Star oh, Wars, man. and then he became a voiceover guy. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Interesting. Easier job. He gets paid big bucks. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, John, if people want to find you, what's the best way for them to kind of like reach out to you or see what you're all about? Um, yeah, I have my website, johnsonpesta.com, uh, Instagram, johnsonpesta, Facebook. Nice. So, basically, uh, yeah, you could go on there and reach out and say hi, man. Send me a message and let's chat. I'm cool with that. I see that. I see that you will definitely return messages. I I always wanted to be that guy because I would send my demo tapes off to famous drummers. I'd be like, hey, I'm in college. I'm I'm working on your thing, man. I want to make it in music. And I would FedEx in my cassette demo and it'd be like crickets. (laughs) It's like, well, there's money I'll never get back. I know. You know? It's a different time, isn't it, right? (laughs) It's a totally different time. And some people, I just, I feel bad sometimes. Like, hey, dude, how come you're not responding to me, man? How come you're not like, I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm kind of busy right now. But we 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 uh, have this uh this Instagram. That, well, he's more than Instagram. He's a YouTube drummer, and he's one of the most widely watched YouTube drummers. His name is Casey Cooper, and he said that he had something like twenty something thousand unreturned emails. Wow. Oh that's it's, that he sent down, or he just yeah, yeah, hasn't responded to. No, he just hasn't responded to. No, well, I mean, think about that. That's I mean, that's insane. Yes, it is, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's so wrong with you, huh? Hey, oh, 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 hey, uh, yeah, hey. We, what's the matter? 
Well, you're talking to my guy all wrong. I got to tell you, the sun is oh, shining wrong. today, John. I don't want to keep you too long, man. I'm right up the street for you, man. I'm like, Good I'm night. like maybe five years from five five miles from you. But yeah, I, well, I don't know about you, but I've been I've seen like two couples in the last eight months in in L.A. and two couples in Nashville. Well, you're really locked down, huh? I mean, I, I don't want this thing. Yeah, I know. You know, I don't know. It's like a. I sound like I go out, but I'm uh, you know. I'm at Gelson's at eight in the morning. I'm I, I'm a morning guy. I'm up at like five six in the morning. So I'm like really oh, shopping now. Take the dog to the dog park and like you know clean up the house and I, I like to get things done. So but <laughs> like, gotta right, live your life. Ten o'clock in the morning now what? <laughs> this is a- <laughs> The drum room, you know? So. Yeah, off to the rolling kit, man. Exactly. Man, I, I I appreciate you sharing your time and wisdom and ah, knowledge with us, man. Hang, man. Great talking to you guys, man. Tell you what, Absolutely. man. JohnTempesta.com. And uh, you know what you could do in this crazy day and age? You can check out his discography, and then you can put a John Tempesta playlist together on Spotify. We couldn't do that when we were kids, man. Not at all. It's, it's a whole time. brave new world, man. Yeah, well, I look forward to running into you socially. And, Jim, thank you so much for your time and talent. And all you thank guys you. out there that are watching, thank you so much. If you're digging the show, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, John. See you guys. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.